Welcome everyone. I am Sonia, Adult Services Librarian at Stickney Forest View Public Library. And today um, we have a great program for African American History Month. And first I just wanted to mention to um, follow us on Facebook where we are live streaming this right now. Um, check our website for our programs. We always have a lot of good things coming on going on um, right now, telling a people's story, African-American children's illustration, illustrated works. Um, we have this display going on right now. So we'll come and see it. And um, yes, always look for, um, we do virtual programs and some more getting back to in-person programs. So um, yeah, so thanks for joining us. And briefly, I am going to introduce Kim. She is an associate professor of English at Roosevelt University and an author. Her book is Black on Earth, African-American Eco-Literacy Traditions. Is that right? Literary, but that's yes. Huh. We're definitely <laughs> gonna talk about eco-literacy. So that was Thank a you. foreshadowing. Eco. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I just met Kim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm so happy. It's great to have, when we have new um, presenters, that, you know, meet a new person because sometimes we have the old favorites, but so great. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to her and she will further introduce herself and her program. Okay, phenomenal. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, it's my pleasure to get more of myself in the screen here so it doesn't look like I don't have a neck. Let's see. How about that? There we go. Well, I guess that's just about the same. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's my pleasure to be here uh, this evening during Black History Month. My name is Kim Ruffin, as Sonia mentioned, and my nature name is Birdsong. I'm an associate professor at Roosevelt University, a forest therapy guide, an amateur birder, and an outdoor Afro volunteer. And I give a special hey y'all to all the outdoor Afros who are here tonight. I am truly happy to talk about our cultural and conceptual uh, Black ancestors and their connection to nature, not just because I'm a lover of history, but also because I know their legacy gives us pathways forward in a world with both lots of ecological beauty and lots of uncertainty at this time. And since we're in this virtual environment, uh, the interactive portions of this event uh, will be more than just a Q&A session at the end. I really invite you to use the chat and reaction features throughout the talk. And I have to say, unfortunately, because of my uh, limitations, I'm unable to react with anyone who might be participating in face with face on the Facebook platform. However, uh, to the degree that uh, Sonia is able to uh, give your information or share your information on the Zoom platform, she will shuttle that information and those comments right over to the Zoom platform. Okay, so at different points, for the folks who are within the Zoom uh, platform, at different points in the talk, I'll ask you to use the chat feature. Um, chat and reaction features uh, to, sorry, ba -da -ba -da -ba, throughout the talk at different points, da -da 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 -da. and so also I'll ask you to just come off mute, and I appreciate those of you who are willing to uh, have yourself on camera, and so um, we're going to just use ra physical raise hands and also the raised hand features if you would like to volunteer to come off mute when I ask you to and share your thoughts. I've designed this presentation with your participation in mind. So if we have a limited um, response, which I hope we won't, and I'm sorry about that phone, then um, we may wind up early, but I hope we don't. I, I think to me this, I could talk about this all night. So um, I'm here as long as you all would like to be. And so um, who wants to wind up early? when uh, we can take time to consider the incredible lives of these eco-ancestors and ourselves. 
So with the pandemic, I'm, I'm sure that most of you probably have a lot of Zoom experience by this point. So you know where the chat and Q&A and reaction uh, features are. If you don't, if you just kind of toggle your cursor at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see that toolbar pop up. Uh, with the reactions all the way on the right side and the chat feature kind of closer to the left side of the screen. Okay, so uh, feel free to use any of those at any time. I may not be able to react or notice all of them in real time, but we can also use them as placeholders. Okay, um, so for our discussion at the end of my presentation. So to be sure you have some practice um, interacting in a moment, I'm going to ask you to help me thank the people who are responsible for me being here tonight. And I have to say, I'm going to stop sharing and, and start sharing. And so things are going to jump around. But at this point, um, I'd like to thank, here's my title screen, my title slide. But I'd also like to thank Mr. Ivan Chance Sanchez and Mrs. Sonia Repi, who are lo librarians at the Stickney Forest View Library. Um, I just want to thank Ivan uh, for inviting me and Sonia for facilitating our discussion tonight. Really, I'd like to thank all librarians uh, for the role that they play in providing places for curiosity, wonder, knowledge, community, and sanctuary. Uh, please find your reaction button and put your camera on uh, for a second so you can show your uh, gratitude. And let's thank Ivan and Sonia and the world's librarians keepers of knowledge, and keepers of community. So if you would, please give your thanks to Sonia and to Ivan. Thank you. That was so nice. Okay, yes, and I wanted to do my reaction button too, but I don't think I can at this moment. <laughs> but thank you, Sonia. All right, so before I ask you to use the chat feature to introduce yourselves, I'd offer, like to offer a... Uh, oops sorry, a land and people acknowledgement. Uh, I acknowledge that I'm in Chicagoland, which is the ancestral homelands of a longstanding Anishinaabe alliance called the Council of Three Fires, which includes the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and the pa Potawatomi. And Chicago is, of course, the contemporary home of many Native, Amer of Native Americans, including the contemporary artist Andrea Olson, who um, in this mural that you're seeing on screen right now, which is along the Chicago River, she points out that Chicagoland includes the unceded land of the Potawatomi. So that translation into English reads, you are on Potawatomi land. And that's by Andrea Olson. When I think about uh, when and where most of my ancestors were indigenous, I think about the environmental knowledge and legacy on the continent of Africa. So I'd like to take time to acknowledge my continental African ancestors, and uh, many of whom were Igbo, from the region that's included within the borders of Nigeria. And I know that my African ancestors brought a lot of ecological knowledge with them through this transatlantic slave trade. And this is my public thank you uh, for that inheritance. And now for you. Um, so many of you have changed your, um, let's see, your Zoom screen names to your uh, nature name as well. So, but if you would, any of you who'd like to do that, take a moment to do that now if you want to. Um, you can use the chat feature if you want to include both that nature name and also any ancestral acknowledgement you would like to give, uh, wherever those ancestors be from. I'd like to give you a moment to just share the following information. I'm going to share my screen again, and you can put this information in the chat. So let's see. If you would, your given um, first name or nickname or your nature name, your pronouns if you wish, and your own ancestral acknowledgement. I'd like to take uh, give you some time to think about that, 
maybe put that in the chat and then we'll move on. Okay. All right. So thank you again. Sonia River. Okay. River is your, your nature name. Okay, Vonda, that's no problem. No problem in changing your name. If you'd like, you can put it within the chat. Um, and if not, then we will go ahead and move on with the folks who have changed their names uh, within Zoom. Okay. Thank you. All right. Here we go. Yes. I think you had it up, Vonda. I think you were a bright star. I remember seeing that. But nevertheless, we won't, we won't fuss over that. I'll go ahead and share my screen again, and we'll get going to the next slide. All right. So here we are in Black History Month, and I'm about to talk about Harriet Tubman again. I know, I know. Some of you probably rolled your eyes when you read that. Let me tell you, though, uh, the woman uh, deserves her own Marvel film universe, in my humble opinion. So I'm not ashamed to mention her each and every Black History Month for the rest of my life. But tonight, I hope that you'll find that I'm highlighting a different perspective on her and the other two African Americans who experienced enslavement who are part of my talk, the gentlemen who are flanking Harriet Tubman. So on my left, I see a statue uh, that is York, uh, the gentleman who was enslaved on the Lewis and Clark expedition. And then the gentleman on the right is George Washington Carver, who is clearly at work in his lab. So these three people give us an opportunity to talk about their accomplishments through the lens of ecological literacy and ecological agency. What do I mean by those terms? Uh, first, ecological literacy, a simple definition of it, one that you will see a lot, is the ability to understand the natural systems that make life on Earth possible, right? And what I would like to do is expand that because to me, the lives of the enslaved people in my talk have really shown me that to me, ecological literacy goes beyond just understanding natural systems. It also extends to these social sy systems that rely on those natural systems too, right? So if I, I've expanded that to say that ecological literacy is also the ability to understand they're in a relationship to the social systems which depend on these natural systems. And then what is eco-agency? This is simply putting what you know about these natural systems and these social systems that rely on those natural systems to work. All right, so putting eco-literacy into practice, whether it be for some individual goal or a collective goal. I also understand eco-agency as the successful negotiation of the human and non-human systems that determine, excuse me, survival and the quality of life, right? So the history I'm talking about tonight is not just in the past. It is in our present. And talking about York, Harriet, and George, through the lenses of eco-literacy and eco-agency, we have a chance to think about how we can attend to our own nature wellness, which I consider to be the improvement to our quality of life that comes from connections to the rest of nature. I bet that the wellness that you get from interviewing a tree or listening to the morning's chorus of a bird song is wellness that you can't get any other way. So I hope I also hope that you might consider the information I'll share as inspiration for giving yourself credit 
for the ecological literacy and agency you've already shown in your life, right? Or perhaps naming the skills and experiences you'd like to get for yourself. So the title of my talk, uh, Standing Near the Heart of Nature, The Legacy of Three Enslaved Eco-Ancestors, comes from um, a sentence in The Souls of Black Folk by W.B. Du Bois. Many of you probably know his, 19, his classic 1903 text. And he, in it, he has this sentence, the slave stood near the, the nature's heart. And in his book, he just does this sort of mic drop thing. He just says that sentence and there's not much more about it. Um, so I don't really have a good sense of what Du Bois felt nature's heart is or was, but I couldn't pass up on that powerful image, right? So that's what has inspired my title. And rather than ask you to speculate what you think Du Bois might have meant, or rather having me speculate about it, I thought I might ask you all um, to put in the chat what you think. What does that image of nature's heart bring to mind to you? And I want to stress right now that there is no one right answer to this. Um, so I hope that you will take some time to fully enjoy just uh, that image and reflecting on what it might mean to you. So if you would take a few uh, minutes right now and think about what is nature's heart. And I'd love to hear some of your comments or see, read some of your comments in the chat. Or for anybody who'd like to talk about it, please, I'd love for you to come off mute. But let's take a, at least a minute of silence to kind of think about it. And then um, we'll get into some discussion. And I'll be sure to watch on my phone to make sure that we don't go over time. What is nature's heart? Feel free. Aha. Uh -huh. OK, excellent. Beth, thank you. When I hear the phrase nature's heart, I think of tree roots. Can you say anything more about that, uh, Beth? Tree roots are always fascinating to me, especially when they you know, are partially visible above ground. But what do you mean by that? And as Beth is thinking, maybe we could have somebody chime in. Yeah, oh great, Raven. To me, nature's heart is the cyclical systems of birth and death across the seasons. Wow, that's beautiful. That is gorgeous. The cyclical systems of birth and death across the seasons. All right, thank you so much, Sunshine. And anyone else want to chime in? Ah, Sonia, when she thinks about nature's heart, she thinks about the sun. That's another gorgeous uh, image. And this comes from a sun worshiper. As you can see, I have my walls painted yellow. <laughs> Anybody else want to chime in um, with their comments um, by coming off mute? No? Okay. Well, then I will share that I really feel um, I define that nature's heart as honoring one's own animality. You know, and I say that word very careful, carefully as a black woman, but I believe ultimately that human beings are animals, right? So honoring one's own animality and connection to other forms of nature, no matter the barriers to that connection. We are nature and we live in a society with its own rules and systems within nature. This requires that we acknowledge that we are in and of nature, while also acknowledging that we are in and of human-made culture. So to sum up, I really feel that uh, nature's heart is somewhere that we could lose ourselves, but also find ourselves, right? If we think about those pitfalls of either of those natural or social systems, 
um, they really have the ability to help us find ourselves, but also they have that capacity where we might lose ourselves too. Within human-made human -made culture, enslaved African Americans were seen only through society's frame of stigmatized animality. So they were seen as beings who were less than human, who it was okay to exploit. The way people understood human uh, cultural diversity emphasized division and systems of status and stigma regarding human physical and cultural diversity. Oppressive human hierarchies negatively racialized entire groups of people who were falsely understood as almost human uh, primitives, right? Or animals who it was okay to exploit and dispossess. This exploitation meant that the primary frame for nature interaction imposed on enslaved African Americans was racialized violence and forced labor on labor camps that some people call plantations. My ancestors, along with non-human animals, were treated as beasts of burden. Uh, they were denied scribal literacy and uh, formal education, by and large. Uh, their marginalization and lives outside the protections of laws led to unstable connection, connections to land, restricted movement, and displacement. Yet, despite their dehumanization and oppression, they remained human beings who often benefited from a direct relationship to non-human nature. They were eco-literate and acted with eco-agency. I wouldn't be here if they didn't. In fact, I contend that a connection to nature was a secret weapon in Black liberation struggles. When the system of slavery said Black people were not human and not worthy of protection, Black people stood near the heart of nature and found ways to survive and thrive. This led to an incredible amount of ecological literacy, yet because of systemic racism, the world tends not to celebrate this fact. And I'd like to help change that um, in this talk. So as people alive today, we have the opportunity to reflect on the credit they deserved while also using their lives to inform our own ecological agency. So at different points in my presentation, I will pause and I'll ask you uh, how you think uh, you might extend their legacy or how it has already been working in your own life. So let's talk about our first eco-ancestor. Let's talk about York. Whoops. There we go. York, who I am... Uh, calling in brief the skilled outdoorsman and survivalist. York's story is a case study of someone with exceptional ecological literacy and denied ecological agency. He was the enslaved body servant or valet of William Clark. You know uh, William Clark, of course, from the Lewis and Clark expedition which was part of America's plan to expand its territory. Clark was invited by Meriwether Lewis to be a part of the Corps of Discovery authorized by Congress and set in motion by the U.S. President uh, Thomas Jefferson. The Corps' task was to travel from the Mississippi Valley to the Pacific Coast, crossing outside the borders of the United States to describe an unfamiliar landscape find viable commercial routes across the continent and establish relations with indigenous people unknown to them. So um, if we think about what they had to do, right? They had to get from here, from St. Louis, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And I wanted to kind of include a map, um, which is on my right, uh, of the time period and also a map later of the United States um, in its fully expanded version, or at least, you know, not with Hawaii and Alaska and the territories here. 
but um, you see all of the various states that this journey, event, what would become eventual states in this other map on the, on the left side. Now, this was all part of the plan to conquer the West. And this was undoubtedly a North America with plenty of established indigenous communities. So it wasn't just peopleless wilderness. Um, so I also want to acknowledge that another part of this legacy of this expedition is the decimation of Native American populations. Let's think together about the context of travel in the early 1800s. On this journey, remember, uh, you're not going to find any expressways, motels. Sorry about my bird clock. But that's what birders do. <laughs> um, satellite towers with cell phones. Sorry big box stores, or even food trucks. You're going to get maybe a boat uh, with some other supplies and some rations, paper maps, maybe some prayers, and not much else. Because one of the reasons that uh, they were sent is because the government wasn't entirely knowledgeable about what was in this area. They would travel from May 14, 1804 to September 23, 1806. Two years, four months, 10 days from their departure from Camp Wood to their return to St. Louis, Louis at the journey's end. They traveled for as few as five miles a day and as many as 20 miles a day. So I ask you, and you can say again in the chat box, or if you'd like to come off mute, I welcome you to do that. Um, please tell me what skills do you think you would need for such an expedition? Yeah, take a moment to think about that. And if you'd like to just come off mute and think about it out loud, feel free to raise your hand either on screen or, um, hi, Tasha, feel free to raise your hand on screen or um, also through the reaction button. So, Tasha, I welcome, I and also to Constance, I don't think that, I, I've welcomed you, so welcome to you as well. I have asked folks what skills they think would be necessary for this immense Lewis and Clark expedition, over 8,000 miles in total, back from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean and back again in 1803 to 18, um, 18, 1804 to 1806. What kind of skills do you think would be necessary? Anybody want to venture a guess? Aha, yes, definitely. Sonia is chiming in with survival skills, hunting, okay? Kind of sounds like a reality show, like Naked and Afraid, maybe. <laughs> Has anybody ever seen one of those? Not quite exactly. But any, anybody else want to chime in with what do you think that the, what the, the people on this uh, expedition would have had to know. Ah, foraging, wayfinding, absolutely, yes. Navigational skills, indeed, for sure. Okay, terrific. Okay, I'm going to share, uh, make sure I got everybody in the chat, and then share my screen again, because you all are exactly right. Okay. So, and I, I want to ask, so why in the world would William Clark choose to bring along an enslaved man who would be a deficit to this mission? Okay, this is pretty hardcore uh, stuff here, right? And uh, I guess before I do this list, which will include many of the things that you've already said, I want to highlight this gorgeous book of poems by Frank X. Walker that gives a window into the kind of ecological literacy that York had. Remember, now he is a body servant, so he has exposure to a, a quality of life, if you will, uh, that's a little bit different than um, slaves who are not, who don't have this kind of position that gives such a close proximity to this enslaver. Um, so he can do all sorts of things, but he never learns how to write. He is never educated and, um, in that way and taught how to write uh, and given the opportunity to do so. 
but nevertheless, he is immensely literate. And these lines from Frank X. Walker's poem, uh, Primer 2, tell, uh, uh, give us a window into that. And I'm going to read them. I can read the heart of a woman in her eyes as easy as a lie in a man's face. The direction and power of a storm speaks clearly to me from low flying bird wings. I can dip my fingers into muddy hoof or toe print and tell how many of what I'm going to have for dinner. The thickness of, a tr of, the thickness of tree bark, walnut hulls, and tobacco worms Tell me how ugly winter going to be. I know the seasons like a book. I can read moss, sunsets, the moon, and a mare's folding time with a touch. That's from Frank X. Walker's second book of poems about York. When Winter Come, I would highly recommend both books that um, he writes in honor of York. His first is called Buffalo Dance, The Journey of York. So if we look at what you've offered in the chat box and also Frank X. Walker's poetry, we can see all sorts of ecological literacy that was expressed in what we know about what York did. And funny enough, this is just what we know from what was recorded in the journals of his enslaver, William Clark, and other white men on the journey. So in my opinion, this is just a small bit of what uh, York knew. I'm sure a lot of what he knew goes far beyond the scope of what is actually recorded in the historical record. So as you mentioned, he, there are wilderness survival skills. He also had a lot of uh, diplomacy and people skills, as I'm sure many uh, enslaved people had. So he knew how to negotiate. He knew how to communicate. And this was crucial. His ability, his diplomacy skills were absolutely crucial in the interactions with the indigenous people that they encountered along this trip. And there are um, numerous recordings of the way in which uh, York would ask, uh, would, would work with indigenous peoples and actually get directions, uh, thinking about wayfinding, a word that was used before. Um, he would actually help in um, getting directions and wayfinding because of his negotiation skills and his ability to interact with Native Americans. Reading weather signs, as you all have mentioned, hunting, animal tracking, he was also a, a gifted marksman. Uh, he was a swimmer, and he also helped with boating. He had horse riding skills and also construction skills. And his building skills also made him invaluable to the Corps during cold winter months. And one of the things that I learned, um, it was interesting to consider, obviously, you know, you would expect anybody has to have a lot of athleticism and physical stamina to be on a journey like this. And also, I've kind of put in that category dance, uh, which is, I think, a wonderful way of knowing nature that we often see in the traditions of indigenous people. And York represents this, too, because we know from these journals that um, several Native American communities were really admiring his, his dances, particularly because they were so different than their own. So they saw the way that York danced at uh, these celebrations that they had, and they admired his, his ability to dance. And I love adding dance as a creative art that can connect us to the natural world. And to kind of sum up, uh, York's contributions were all along the route as he found food, helped carry a boat and its cargo between two navigable waters, traded with individual tribes, and fascinated the Indians with his size and his color. It became natural for Lewis and Clark to turn to York for securing food, horses, and directions from the Indians. And to go back a little bit, um, some, some of the Native American tribes were fascinated by York's beautiful black skin 
And the Mandan tribe called him Big Medicine and uh, giving him this kind of exalted status because of his color and which they saw as a science, sign of strength. Um, so as I mentioned, it became natural for Lewis and Clark to turn on to, to York for securing food, horses, and directions from the Indians. All this, yet, after 29 uh, of the adventurers returned from the expedition, explorations, York received no pay. No promised 320 acres of land that went each to um, all of the other explorers who were on this journey. And he was not even officially listed as a member of the team. So at the end of York's life includes 10 more years after he gets back from this Lewis and Clark expedition. He has 10 more years of grueling chattel enslavement after the epic journey of a lifetime and heart-wrenching forced separation from his wife, who he desperately wanted to live close to because they were enslaved by two different masters. After the expedition, York was denied the opportunity to live life as a free man and share his ecological knowledge and experience freely with those who he loved. Today, we can celebrate the breadth of his ecological literacy and honor heart, the heartbreak that uh, must have come from the limitations placed on his age, ecological agency. Yet his legacy of wilderness survival and social skills live on. There are many names for this kind of knowledge that we use today. What, uh, you know, primitive skills, some people call themselves preppers or survivalists. Um, emergency preparedness uh, comes up. It makes me think, oh, yeah, York is, is kind of uh, giving us a sense of what does it mean to live in this direct relationship with nature and be prepared for emergencies, life skills, and first aid training. Do any of you have any of these kind of skills already? Anybody? No? Okay. All right. If you don't, do you see any benefit in learning them? Beth shaking her head, yes. Can you say more about that? I mean, I was, I've been thinking about it as you were talking about how few skills in the natural areas I have. And I was trying to think about what, why that might be, but I do think it's just um, I just think we are socialized to, um, you know, prevail and to succeed intellectually or, um, through, you know, through learning through, um, you know, particularly my generation. So I just, you know, I think there's a, a, a discon disconnect. Um, but when I think about wanting to dive into these things, and yeah, it would be great to you know, have boating skills or certain skills of like how to survive in the boat. I feel uh, fear. I don't feel comfortable uh, in these spaces. And I mean, for <laughs> just, I think the history of our country and where these spaces to um, develop these skills have not been accessible. They have, I mean, literally been at points in history off limits to, to people of color. And I think that even though now that's not as um, institutionalized, I guess. It's still, I do think that I still feel uncomfortable about being in the spaces where that type of stuff would be, um, where you can master those skills. Yeah. So, you know, even when I'm bird watching or stargazing, I still have, um, I feel uncomfortable or I feel uh, unsafe or, you know, um, unless it's on my own property or something, but when I'm going out and doing those things. So uh, I think those things compound if you don't originally have those skills and then um, it gets, there's other things that happen when you think about, um, you know, what, you know, obtaining those skills might, what risk that might be, whether you want to or not. So that's just what I was thinking. I'm not sure. I'm not saying that that's everyone's 
you know, that's what it is. But that's just what I was thinking while you were talking. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Beth, for sharing that. I, I respect that you've shared that fear that you have. Um, I think it is absolutely, absolutely legitimate. And I understand where it comes from. Uh, because obviously black people have experienced wilderness as a site of terror, right, uh, of racialized terror. And, um, you know, I think at the same time, I have this experience of being an outdoor Afro leader. And my, um, I would recommend to you that you consider maybe joining us on an event, uh, because um, oftentimes I think because in black uh, Outdoor Afro is a national organization that has the mission to connect people with the outdoors, connect black people to, with the outdoors. And we have a Facebook group uh, for our Chicago, uh, Northwest Indiana uh, network. And also we have a meetup group where you will find all of the events um, that we have coming up. And one of those events will be this bird count event that I have on the 19th that Linda and I will be at. And so I agree that um, having, you know, having this kind of broken legacy, because I, one of the strengths that I think that Black people have had is that ability to pivot, you know. At one time, we were people who were very well versed in rural life and experience. And then the great migration comes and we pivot, right? And then we're all about the city and we are surviving in the city and doing what it takes. And in so many ways, I think that there's that gap for at least some black people who are especially in urban and northern areas. I don't think it's the case so much for uh, southern and, and rural black people. We don't have this history of sort of a family connection to these uh, literacies. And with that history of racialized terror um, as part of the of wilderness experience of African Americans, you don't really have uh, uh, the competence to try to learn them, even if you can see value in knowing them. So I encourage anyone who's not aware of uh, Outdoor Afro to take a look at us and to consider joining us. It's free. And our events are free or um, at costs that are identified. We have a combination of both events that cost if they're with third party vendors and also events that we as volunteer leaders run ourselves. So I hope to see you at a future Outdoor Afro event, um, Beth. Anybody else want to chime in? Do we have any preppers out there, any survivalists? I know we have a forager among um, in our midst. If, if, if Tasha is available to talk about uh, the benefits to her life that she's had uh, from foraging, I'd, I'd love to invite her to do so if she's willing. Hey, yeah, I just popped on. I'm driving home. I can talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm good, though. Um, this is so, I love this. I love everything you just said. Um, but I'd love to talk shortly about foraging. Um, the, I, you know, a lot of, I feel like a lot of our moms or something did gardening, at least up north, if you're from up north. So I really wasn't that into it, but then I married a gardener and I really just enjoy not the gardening part, but the picking, <laughs> the picking of the fruit and the food. And I started to do, learn a few species, um, a few years ago, but then the pandemic hit. And I feel like I became a pandemic forager um, because of, of the opportunity to be out in nature for so long and no one's there. And I discovered people like Black Forager on TikTok and Instagram. And she talks a lot about our legacy of Black Americans, our extreme, um, just amazing legacy of how much how much we knew and relied on the land. And I was amazed. So it's really exciting to learn um, these a few new skills. But there's so much we can forge off the land up north. Um, even right now, there's a little bit going on. Um, but that's, that's fun to learn. <laughs> Is that good, Kim? I don't know. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tasha. And I really do appreciate yeah. it. I won't call on you again because you're driving home, girl. And I want you to <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Anybody else? Want to chime in? 
Okay. If not, we're going to keep going. Oh, sorry, Vonda, please. Just going to say, um, I am from the country, <laughs> um, family of country people. My father was, uh, you know, he hunted and, you know, he had farm animals, you know, my cousins and all of this and gardens and things like that. And my grandparents' gardens. I never liked that part, but I did like the nature aspect and being a part of that. But when you were speaking earlier, I was thinking, I feel like there is a, with black people, there is a disconnect of the appreciation of that culture. Because I, when I came here, I live in Indianapolis, Indiana. And so when I came here, it was almost foreign and, and it's almost not celebrated that you are from an area like that or you have a family history of that. So I feel like there's a disconnect with nature and, and all of that with the African Americans. I agree. Unfortunately, I have heard that this is the hard, this is against the country folks, right? <laughs> oh, you act in country. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I think to me, I mean, I obviously I don't endorse that. But I, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not saying that it, it was right, but I, I can see it as part of that pivot. You know, if I've got to exist in this in, in urban environment, and it is so hard for Black people to do so, if leaving behind that country identity is going to get me any advantage, then maybe that was part of the reason why it was done. I think it's obviously unfortunate because it did create a disconnect. I agree with you 100%, Vonda. Um, but I think that we're getting to a stage where people are looking for it again and looking to reconnect. Um, so we owe an apology to the, our country cousins, don't we? <laughs> for sure. Okay. Thank you all very much for participating. I'm going to move on here. So. Um, I'm going to jump next to, I return to the life of Harriet Tubman, not only because it is heroic and unique, but also symbolic of larger African-American history. Despite the experience of being treated as though they were only animals to exploit, Black history is filled with us responding to the oppression in our lives in ways that honor our humanity and make liberatory connections uh, to nature. As a child, Harriet wanted to escape the abuse she endured within her enslaver's home. In exercising the little agency she did have, she was able to work outdoors with her father and thinking about Vonda's uh, comment. She responded to her own need for a safe place and found it among the trees and the black men who worked in the woodlands. So Beth, this is kind of, it was the opposite um, situation for her. She was exposed to a lot of violence within the home. And she said, wait a minute, I, I need to get out of here. So as a child, she was able to express this and she was then located outside and frequently worked with her father, who was a timber inspector and superintended the cutting and hauling of great quantities of timber uh, for the Baltimore shipyards. Kate Clifford Lawson writes, on the cusp of adulthood, the disabled Tubman went to work on a timber gang exhibiting great skills, laboring in the logging camps and in the fields. There she was exposed to the secret communication networks that were the province of black watermen and other free and enslaved fat, uh, blacks. Here in the forest, beyond the watchful eye of white masters, the male slaves had access to the watermen who worked in the area. They knew the safe places, they knew the sympathetic whites, and more important, they knew the danger. Because of these men shared their because these men shared their humanity and knowledge with Harriet, she gained the social and environmental literacy necessary to transport herself and numerous others out of enslavement. Tubman formed forged her liberation outdoors because of these men and her bravery. 
And I love how this epic story, a part of her story, uh, shows the importance of the communal transfer of environmental knowledge. So yes, uh, Harriet navigated with the North Star. She used her faith and she had allies on the Underground Railroad. But she also received this navigational skill from this community of black men, including her father, who were ecological mentors and that fueled her legacy of liberation. And I think about her father knowing that she, what she wanted to do with this information and thinking about the deep love uh, that a father would have in sharing that information, knowing that he might never see his daughter again should she put it into practice. Now, she made sure that didn't happen because she went and she got her father. She got so many members of her family um, up to freedom as well. But nevertheless, he did not have that guarantee or that knowledge when she first put this navigational skill to use. And right now, we're in a season that was key to that liberation. One admirer of Harriet Tubman said she always came in winter. And that's helping me see winter a different way. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, this is Harriet Tubman's. Um, thank you so much for coming, Beth. Take care. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of like uh, revisioning winter because of that, knowing that Harriet Tubman often came in winter. Why? Because the nights were long and dark and there were fewer people outside. They were less likely to be seen by someone. Right. So in this season of liberation, I'd like for you to think about the kind of ecological or environmental knowledge that you'd like to discover and or transfer to a family member other than loved ones. Um, and if you like, you can uh, share that in the chat. We'll just take a moment to think about that. And I'm very knowledgeable about the time. I see that it's six, uh, almost 6.30. And so I will be careful that to get to everything and, and abbreviate when necessary. But if you will, in thinking about extending Harriet's um, legacy, what kind of ecological knowledge might you want to discover with a loved one or transfer to a loved one or a family member? Maybe you can think about that for a second. You're welcome to share it in the chat. Um, and we'll see what you say or enjoy the silence. Okay, you all can keep that close to your, oh, here we go. Ah, yeah, I hear you, Tasha. I'd love to learn wayfinding with moss and the sun. That would be great. Uh, you know, I've always been attracted to moss because of its textural elements, but the very fact that it could help someone actually move about in the world is pretty astounding to me. And so I, I, I can see why you're attracted to that skill. Okay. Anybody else? If not, I'm going to move on to another. Oh, yes, Vonda. Yeah to embrace the stillness and calm of nature and allow it to further shape us. Yeah, you know, Vonda, I really think about um, George Washington Carver when you say that, and for reasons that I'll explain when we get to him. But thank you for sharing that. Let's see here. Yeah. Okay, so back to my slide here. Glennette. Tilly Turner's children book, children's book, An Apple for Harriet Tubman. Um, this book tells the true story of the young Harriet, whose name was Araminta, uh, which means a fragrant flower, which I think is very pretty. She was forced to pick apples on the Brodus Plantation in Maryland, where her entire family was enslaved. The enslaved could not eat the apples that they picked without risking physical violence, an in integral feature of institutionalized slavery. One day, Araminta thought the conditions were right to take that risk. And because she was penalized for her agency, her body was forever scarred with the brutality of slavery. 
Yet this experience of being treated as a beast of burden, denied access to a nourishing apple, Araminta made a commitment to herself to have a relationship of her own making with apple trees. She made a promise to herself that one day she would invert the relationship of exclusion and oppression she was forced to have with the trees of her childhood. Now, uh, we know this because of a story recorded in Jean Humez's book, Harriet Tubman, uh, The Life and the Stories. Remember, all of the information um, uh, we have about Harriet Tubman, uh, just like York, we have it comes secondhand because she was not given the chance to learn to read and write. Uh, the writer who recorded this story was in conversation with Tubman, who was looking at a nearby apple orchard when she asked that writer, do you like apples? And the writer goes on to say, on being assured that I did, Harriet said, did you ever plant any apple trees? With shame, I confessed I had not, the writer said. No, Harriet said. I liked apples when I was young, and I said, someday I'll plant apples myself for other young folks to eat. And I guess I'd done it. And then this writer says, then she laughed as though a sudden comical recollection, recollection had come over her, and she throwed back um, her furrowed face and burst into a wild melody, beating time with her hands upon her knees and gleefully swaying to and fro. Now, I'm going to try this. Please bear with me, okay? There's a cider and brandy in the cellar, and my people, they'll have some. Must be now the kingdom's coming and the year of jubilum. That's the song, or at least some of the lines of the song that Harriet sang as part of the story. Uh, oh, thank you, Tasha. You are too kind, girl. <laughs> I don't know about you, but this small little story is so rich. I'm drawn to the idea that Harriet asked the writer about planting trees of a fruit that he liked, assuming that he too might have taken his ecological literacy into some next level ecological agency by becoming not only a consumer of apples, but a planter of an apple tree. Um, and I'm also drawn to the incredible joy it seems Tubman had in talking about her own ecological agency. She put her accomplishment to song, and within that song, she celebrates not just the fact uh, that she kept a vow to herself, but also the ability to app of apples to feed uh, her people. And these were the apples that she planted. In her elder years, Harriet fulfilled that commitment to herself, born in that enslaver's orchard. At her home in Auburn, New York, Harriet Tubman planted an apple orchard of her own. In a gesture that reinforced the idea of communal and environmental health, she shared apples with the community around her. The agency took, uh, Tubman took with her life ensured that she would have the last laugh in a life that could have uh, been only a story of obliteration from the rest of nature and that disconnection that Vonda talked about. Okay. Um, what do you take away from this story of Tubman's life? How might you take some ecological literacy or love that you have to the next level? Is there some moment from your childhood uh, that involved nature that might inspire your ecological agency today? Feel free to put your response in the chat, and if we um, and we do have time to hear from people who'd like to share it out loud. Let me see. I think I have a a slide with that question too. Summing it up. Nope, I don't. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I, out of respect of time, I'm going to um, keep going, but maybe if people put that in the chat, we can come back to it. And lastly, I'd like to point out that Harriet Tubman's, um, Harriet Tubman was also uh, an herbalist and healer. And this was the interesting, we kind of got that picture of what the ecological legacy that she got from her father, right, and these other black men. This is representative of that knowledge that she got 
from uh, her mother, who was a nurse. And so we have this longstanding tradition of black women healers and herbalists within African-American culture. And Harriet Tubman's mother and Harriet Tubman herself were part of it. Black women herbalists were legendary. Charlotte Fett, in her landmark book, Working Cures, Healing, Health, and Power on Southern Slave Plantations Rights, the wealth of curative and preventative remedies used by enslaved mothers testified to their knowledge of medicinal plants. Enslaved communities not only recognized skill, but also attributed authority to older doctors. This acknowledgement of older women's authority was based on criteria not generally recognized by whites, spiritual empowerment respect for elders, and acknowledgement of herbal expertise, right? And then this slide I have as um, some evidence of that. In this latest book, A Guide to Harriet Tubman's Eastern Shore, a really beautiful book with a lot of pictures from the area in which Harriet Tubman lived, it, it says, Harriet had acquired quite a reputation for her skill in curing dysentery by a medicine she prepared from roots which grew near the waters which gave the disease. She found thousands of sick soldiers and immediately gave up her, up her time and attention to them. Also, um, she continued to apply her ecological literacy um, of medicinal plants after the war. All her post-war life, she made trips to whatever woodland was adjacent for the purpose of digging the root that was the basis for her remedy. Um, sometimes the identity of the plant was kept, uh, was a well-kept secret. Okay. And that will end um, this discussion of Harriet Tubman. And as I make my transition to George Washington Carver, I'd like to kind of focus on the epic quality of all of the lives of the people in my discussion tonight. And think about what makes something epic, grand scale, you know, a heroic journey, an extended struggle, immersion in a different space, right? Obviously being enslaved means that you're signed up for an epic you did not choose. I hope that the responses of York, Harriet, and George may demonstrate the liberatory efforts and responses to enslavement, right? Also, I wanna say that their stories are part of the American epic, and their lives are part of the National Park Service. Um, often, national parks conjure up landscapes such as the Grand Canyon and Yellowstone, and for sure, those places have that epic quality of their own and, and provide that kind of epic experience. But people such as York, Harriet, and George can also serve as inspiration to participate in the epic that is the National Park Service. Um, and there are four sites. Uh-oh. I thought I put this up here. I'm sorry. I, didn't. I thought I created this slide. So I'll just say this um, to you here. Uh, there are four sites that pertain specifically to these individuals. And did you all know there are only 10 national historic monuments that are part of the National Park Service that pertain to women, and that two of those are dedicated to Harriet Tubman. So yeah, that's exciting. And um, so we have the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historical Park in Church Creek, Maryland. We also have the Harriet Tubman National Park in Auburn, New York. Okay. I went last year to the George Washington Carver National Monument in Diamond, Missouri, uh, and, which is about five hours uh, from Chicagoland. And I would highly recommend uh, that you make a, a trip down there. 
You could do it in a day, but I say, you know, maybe make it an overnight trip and visit it twice uh, because it's, it's a really uh, gorgeous and special place that I had not had the occasion to go to yet, and I'm so glad I finally did. And then you have the 4,900 miles of Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail, uh, with, which includes 16 states. If you'd like to recreate or involve yourself in any part of that journey that York took, you're welcome to go on that Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. Um, okay, I'm not ready to go with you, uh, but nevertheless, I'm working on my fitness, and I'm, I'm about to get ready to go, or be ready, let's say that much. <laughs> okay, let's get to our final equal ancestor here. So, we have George Washington Carver, artist, scientist, and believer. George Washington Carver is the final equal ancestor in our discussion this evening. His legacy is a multidisciplinary one because he related to the natural world in several ways. As an artist, as a scientist, and as a man of faith. Carver was a pioneer uh, as an agriculturalist and botanist, introducing methods of soil conservation to farmers, inventing hundreds of byproducts from peanuts, pecans, sweet potatoes, and soybeans, and practicing zero-waste sustainability, okay? He was way before his time in that regard. And Carver had a multifaceted relationship to plants. As a young person, he was a plant doctor who took care of neighborhood plants. He went on to the formal study of plants as a student, and as a scientist, he transformed plants into several products that benefited both human beings and the land itself. Carver also admired nature's beauty by making art inspired by what he saw outdoors. He even wrote, all, of, all my life, I have risen regularly at 4 a.m. and gone into the woods and talked to God. There he gives me my orders for the day. It is in these daily walks in the woods that Carver would also find the subjects for his art. In fact, when he began making art, he was so resourceful that he transformed what he found outdoors into his own art materials, making pigments out of bark, uh, berries, and roots, and painting on things like flat rocks instead of canvas. Later in his life, his large-scale painting called Yucca and Cactus even won honorable mention at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. And you'll see him pictured with this, you know, large-scale painting of uh, Yucca and Cactus on this slide on the screen. So it's no surprise that Carver said, nothing pleases me more than to take my pencils, paint, brushes, sketchbook, and spend a day in the woods. He loved both the beauty and utility of nature. And I've become fascinated uh, with the idea of, of art as a way of connecting with nature. And I have to say that my in initial impressions have grown quite a bit about what art as a way of connecting with nature actually offers. Um, since I'm not gifted in the visual arts, I was reluctant to do it, um, but I have since learned that it is a skill that can be developed. And needless to say, I am in the early stages of listing art as one of my skills. At this point, I just think it's more important to use as a tool that can simply be used as a method to better connect with nature. Um, and I believe in connecting with art so much that I'm willing to show you the result of some of my time that I spent outside drawing with some really simple, just really basic uh, colored pencils. This pack of 12 pencils cost me $6. You know, you can get a pack of eight for $4. Um, and this is a St Stickney Forest View Public Library exclusive. I'm going to be have a little vulnerability here and actually show you uh, my art, so please promise to take any negative comments that you have about it offline. 
I'd appreciate it. And so I know that I do this to make a point. So here is my very simple drawing of two trees that I made uh, this winter, actually about a week ago. I went and I took a, a pad. Thank you very much, Vonda. I needed that. <laughs> uh, but I took a very simple knee pad that I use for yoga out and put it on a bench, brought my uh, book and my pencils, and I just kind of wandered around the park to see what I was inspired by. And lo and behold, I got really interested in what I imagined to be this conversation between this larger, older, uh, black colored tree and this sort of smaller, younger uh, cinnamon colored tree that had all of these little remnants of fall, as I like to call them, these leaves that were still on the tree. And um, so I, I and, and, you know, when I look back on this, I'm not looking to see great trees. I'm, I remember I'm taken right back to that day where I know that sun was so crisp. It was a gorgeous day. I remember what the clouds looked like, even though I couldn't capture it here with uh, my drawing. And um, I just have such fond, positive mental health benefits that I know came from spending this time in nature. And so it really reminds me of the incredible lift to my spirit that experience uh, brought to me. Anybody hear uh, Nature Journal or do any other kind of art? related to uh, nature? Or would you consider it? No? Okay, just in case you're being shy about it. <laughs> I do want one day, Tasha says one day. Thank you. I'm going to hold you to that, Tasha. Um, I'd encourage you all to join, uh, to take a look at the, and I'll put his name in the chat. There's a gentleman with all sorts. There's two people I want to uh, encourage you to look up. John Muir Laws is a, an educator who has, he's just this enormous treasure trove of free information about, oh, wow, nice, excellent, Raven. So you've been collecting petals and drying them to use later. Not, not, you're not sure for what yet? But yes, they'll be there when you do figure that out. That's beautiful. I hope you enjoy it. And those are some things. I, I know that some people, some nature journals are more like scrapbooks. And they can include those, you know, like 3D elements and, and have like a scrapbook uh, feature that you might include there. Um, and the gentleman that I put in the chat, John Muir Laws, is uh, he offers a lot of free material. In fact, he has, if you look on his events page for his Nature Journal Club, yeah, Linda, you've thought about art therapy. Absolutely, for sure. Um, that's a good point and, and a good connection. I have a, a similar interest, and I think I might be taking a look in, in the scholarship and the uh, practice about that as well. And uh, John Muir Laws has this wonderful calendar. He um, kind of is a, a person who, co who uh, consolidates a lot of information about nature journaling, and he has a calendar, and there's going to be a starters club uh, run by a woman who is, and this is for absolute beginners, even though I know inevitably there's going to be somebody in there who has, you know, 800, you know, pencils and watercolors and has, you know, seven, you know, it's supposed to be for absolute beginners and she's offering this for free. And so, so much, so much of this information is for free. And also I want to share with you a wonderful, um, I want to get his middle initial right since his name is so familiar. Um, mm. Anyway, this is an African-American gentleman who has, uh, who's a wonderful painter and nature journaler, and he has some YouTube videos up. Um, his, he has a family farm, actually, and he does a lot of images um, in, his, uh, in his Alabama neighborhood, and he had a wonderful talk on this podcast that I'd listened to which is, in fact, let me look there real quick, and I'm going to find this in an instant. Um, journaling with Nature is the, the name of the 
podcast and I'm going to scroll down and get to his, so I get ah, Timothy M. Joe. So if his middle initial is M as, and I'll put that in, in there. Timothy M. Joe, I encourage you to listen to his, there's a two-part uh, Journaling with Nature podcast. I'll put that. Journaling with Nature. Timothy M. Joe guest speaker, artist. And again, he does have YouTube videos, I do believe, that are under his name. And he's a big inspiration. I really like his um, idea of nature journaling with history in mind. And those are some resources. So in thinking uh, back to, did I miss anybody? Yeah, okay, we got everybody there. Um, to George Washington Carver, he's also a role model uh, for the benefits of regular exposure to nature. Um, and there's plenty of science to support the human health benefits of being outdoors with nature too. And I wanted to play this brief video to, um, actually, let me make sure I'm sharing my screen, to share those benefits with you. This is, oh, wait a minute. All right. This is going to go by in a flash, so I just want to make sure I've got my screen large enough. And, oh, you know what? Let me stop this to make sure I am optimizing, okay, for the video clip. All right. Walk into a forest, and within five minutes, your body and brain start to change. Your heart rate slows. Your facial muscles start to relax. Your hard-working frontal lobes begin to quiet down. And this will boost your productivity and creativity later in the day. I'm Florence Williams, and I've spent the last couple of years writing a book about how being in nature actually makes us more human. Here are some of the things I've learned from the new science looking at nature and our health. The smell of pine trees strengthens your immune system. When you hear birdsong or look at fractal patterns in nature, your brain puts out more alpha waves, making you feel both calm and alert. If you spend an hour and a half walking around living plants and animals, you'll be less preoccupied by your personal problems and feel more connected to people and the world around you. Finnish researchers say being in nature a minimum of five hours a month can make you happier overall. Why not give it a try? Go outside, go often, bring friends, breathe. So what did you all think about that uh, video? It spe uh, specifically, um, in the Nature Fix, we learned that, uh, I'm sorry, my questions were, uh, what are the source of human health benefits from nature? Like, did you get it? I know the, sh the video was real quick, uh, but did you get a sense of how we as human beings get these um, benefits from nature? Anybody want to venture a guess or just tell me what you what you know? Um, increasing the immune system, uh, releasing endorphins uh, for relaxation and calming, um, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Those are definitely part of the benefits of being outdoors. But how do how does the how does nature get that to us? Like, how does it how does it happen? How are we transformed? What, what is the mechanism that does that? Anybody want to think about that? Thank you very much, Fonda. You're welcome to chime in again if you want. 
Maybe one way could be color. Um, certain colors just make us happy. So maybe if you go into a forest when it's not freezing, <laughs> like the trees, but even now if the sky is blue, something like that. Absolutely, Tasha. You are pointing out one of those things which are our senses, okay? It is that sensory connection. And I recently heard that um, the colors blue and green um, help us to relax. And so the sky, as you mentioned, has that kind of impact on us. And that's through, you know, uh, we're very sight oriented for those of us who are sighted. We're very sight oriented. And so that is one way through our sense of sight that we gain these benefits from nature. But we gain them from other senses too. And it, to Tasha's point about sight, that video mentioned those fractal patterns. So even shape. If we see all of these various leaf shapes, and especially in the wintertime, you know, it's like you have this sculptural quality to the trees. I went out to the trees on Saturday and the snow was so beautiful. You could see the light reflecting on all of the uh, snowflakes and it was almost like a gallery of bark uh, throughout the, the, and I was really able to connect with bark. I, I don't think in a way that I would usually do if I am, thank you, Tasha, in the summertime, you know, in the summertime, I think I'm distracted by so many other things, but I got to appreciate uh, the tree bark in a way that I had not before, because I enjoyed seeing it through uh, this kind of illumination from the snow. And, um, but obviously our sense of, of smell, uh, our hearing, ta even taste to some degree, especially if you're a, a forager like Tasha, can give you a connection to nature um, that brings you immediate health benefits, the ones that po uh, Vonda pointed out, all right? And so researchers, it's interesting, in the Nature Fix, we, we learn that this effort to quantify uh, the nature and health connection has yielded enough data to know that health benefits work on a dose curve, which means that the benefits change according to the kind of doses that you get. And, you know, George Washington Carver's practice of regularly, oopsie, wrong screen, uh, regularly going out to the woods was a particular kind of dose. Uh, you know what? Actually, I did want that other one. Sorry. Okay. I wanted to show you in thinking about this dosage curve this nature period. So if we think about George Washington Carver's at the bottom of this um, nature pyramid, you have uh, nature doses that are nearby. And these are things that you can get quite quickly. You remember in that video, uh, Florence Williams talking about within five minutes, your body is already responding to these positive stimuli in nature. And so at the bottom of this pyramid, they're, um, they're explaining that part of this dosage curve is a regular nearby nature exposure, right, that you could get, you know, hourly, whatever. But these, the, the changes on us and our, the reaction from our animality changes as our kind of dosage changes. So they're suggesting, right, here we, they're in their recommendations these casual interactions in your neighborhood daily at the bottom of this. So you have lots of those. So that's why it's at the bottom of the pyramid. And then going up this pyramid, you have that kind of more regional exposure where you're spending, say, one hour weekly in an intentional nature area, such as a regional park or green space. So maybe especially if you're in the Chicagoland region, which I know, Vonda, you're in Indiana, um, we in Chicagoland, we have one of the, well, we obviously welcome you to come visit us. Uh, we have one of the largest forest preserves. In fact, we have the oldest and largest forest preserve in the country. And so say you want to go to a forest preserve and make, add some variety to your exposure, exposure. You're going to get a different impact on your body, right? And then it suggests a kind of a monthly trip uh, to something more, um, you know, distant 
and maybe like a regional park. Maybe you might go to Starve Rock or even the Indiana Dunes. Um, and then they're suggesting, especially these sort of extended, immersive trips, um, these kind of that have that kind of epic quality uh, to them, they can really help you to, if you look at number four, um, unplug and get off the grid in a remote, farther flung natural area for at least um, a three-day period. They're recommending yearly, you know, but you do what you can do. Uh, and so in, in the Nature Fix, she gives us some detail about how our reaction changes. And it's interesting to me, at the top of the pyramid, um, actually those kind of epic trips, they bring us closer to human beings oftentimes, especially if we take these, like a camping trip with other people. Um, that epic trip can give you a different impact than, say, walking your dog outside regularly, right? And so that's just a little information about that nature pyramid idea and the fact that George Washington Carver, I think, is our best example of a man who benefited from that regular exposure to nature and through uh, experiencing nature as art. So as we move uh, to a close to the presentation um, portion of tonight's event, I'd like to focus on George Washington Carver as a man of faith. Oh, wrong, pardon me. Um, oop, there we go. So I hope, yeah, here we go. Yeah, I'll get to those quotes in a minute. Um, his accomplishments as a plant scientist are probably very familiar to, the, uh, to you all, and um, that aspect of his life is an inspiration to us all, in part because he was a scientist that was so interested in helping poor farmers and improving the soil health on which they depended. However, I'd like to spotlight the ways in which he saw faith as compatible, even as central to his scientific outlook. Uh, you know, we live in a time um, when it seems that religion and science are frequently at odds with one another, at least in some pu public discourse. Uh, yet Carver saw the two ways of knowing as intertwined. And I have two quotations here that um, demonstrate that. He says, we get closer to God as we get more intimately um, Oh boy, I didn't write that right. I apologize. As we um, as we get more intimate with nature and understandingly acquainted with the things he has created, I know of nothing more inspiring that the um, that of make than that of making discoveries for oneself. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water and try to read better. <laughs> Sorry about that. And he says in this second quotation here, I, when I touch that flower, I am not merely touching that flower. I am touching infinity. That little flower existed long before there were human beings on this earth. It will continue to exist for thousands, yes, millions of years to come. And I share these quotations to really honor this side of George Washington Carver and for those of you for whom are religious. Now, as a forest therapy guide, I also know that the spiritual side of nature can be experienced with or without a religious context. And I invite you to experience forest therapy uh, through either of these guided walks. I am going to put in the chat in just a second here. I am going to work on that while we have some discussion, but I want to say in conclusion, as people who began as African Americans who were either quasi-free or enslaved and then later free and criminalized, African Americans' relationship to nature was pushed outside of civic endorsement and protections. 
Yet because African Americans refuse to let the framework of racialized violence and stigmatized animality be the only frame for their own perceptions of nature, they were able to honor their humanity and make their experience as humans another tradition within the collective story. I hope their stories of exercising their ecological literacy and agency against incredible odds inspire you to explore your own ecological literacy and agency. Thank you very much. And as we close, I am going to get these uh, walks up in the chat box. And while I do that, I'd like to open it up um, to you all and see if you have any comments or questions for me. Yeah, here's one of them. Let's see here. In the chat. You're welcome, Vonda. Here is one of the forest therapy walks that appears in Emergence Magazine. It's called A Forest Walk. And then I have another one that was created specifically for the forest preserves here in Cook County. I'll have that one up in a second. And so let's see here. Healthy and vibrant for human. Okay. And there is the other one. Okay. All right. Now I'm imagining that we will have some folks who want to participate and talk. And I hope I'm, I'm right about that. So let me get my screen back up where it needs to be. Oh, thank you very much, Tasha. Okay. Anybody else? Any final thoughts, questions, comments, plans, or ways in which you've already, I think several of you have already uh, shared that, but do you want to give yourself credit for ecological literacy that you already have? I think that's important to recognize too. Anybody? Oh, I thought you all would be more talkative. <laughs> if not, I don't want to pressure you. But I'll stick around for the pregnant pauses. I'm there for that. <laughs> yes, so, sunshine. I, uh, I'll just say that I really, uh, really appreciated this talk, and it really made me um, made me feel like I'm a, I don't know, like I, I want to get back out there. I usually try to avoid the winters a little bit, but... Um, as you mentioned with uh, Harriet Tubman, there's still a lot out there to, to see um, and to feel. And I mean, the, the air is cold, but it's still nice and crisp. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I can, I can definitely tell the difference when I'm, when I'm not outside. So yeah, it's been very, um, very, very encouraging. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Raven. And I like to say, um, you know, I, I find my body, especially as, at this time of the winter, I think that that initial acclimation that we have to make is so tough in November and December. I mean, 30 degrees just feels like, oh, the worst. But now it's just like 30 degrees. Where's my, where's my sweater at? I don't need my coat. You know, I mean, maybe not that extreme. But nevertheless, I feel like we're a little bit more acclimatized at this point in the winter. Yes, you still have to layer. Yes, you still need the right gear. Uh, but it can be, I'm, I'm here as a living witness. It is definitely beneficial to get out. And I like to get out in the midday, if possible. Um, I find the, it's because there's so little light and ice to me is, you know, scary to walk on. 
um, especially if you don't have some nice things like yak tracks. I don't always have those on my shoes, but that's a piece of gear I would definitely recommend. Uh, which gives you that extra traction for the bottom of your uh, shoes or boots. Uh, but bid day, to me, because oftentimes there's so much sun available, it can really be beneficial since we are so light-deprived in the winter. Um, so I really do hope you enjoy uh, getting out there. Anybody else? I was just, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, who is that? Vonda, that was, please. And sorry, my camera, I'm having problems, so my camera keeps going out. Um, but as you were speaking about the journaling, I recently went um, to New Orleans, and I went on a plantation, the Laurel Plantation, and I actually took um, a couple of the leaves from the trees, and I, I dried them out and what have you, and I want to really travel. There's a string of plantations in that area. But I thought about just kind of getting, going to those different plantations, taking a leave and just mm -hmm. putting that in a journal book and just kind of writing my thoughts and just whenever I feel as though I can't do X, Y, and Z, to really look at those leaves and remember what our ancestors went through. And they absolutely, they went through so much more than we could ever possibly go through. We absolutely can. We can do whatever. And I just thought about maybe doing that. So when you were doing this um, journaling and talking about that, I, that's something I thought, hmm, I should probably do that. Oh, that sounds like a wonderful project. And my reaction was because I remember, this was a long time ago, but I took a, a group of students with a colleague to uh, New Orleans to study uh, the black culture there. Um, and to me, you know, New Orleans is one of the blackest cities in America. And, you know, I mean that because it is so positively rich with culture. Yes. And we went to the Laura Plantation. Oh, OK. In part because it was one of the more progressive, I would say, yeah. you know, uh, plantations where, you know, there weren't weddings going on and, and women, yeah. you know, and, and, and hoop skirts and things like that. Uh, but my goodness, that's a great idea. Uh, to bring a leaf home um, yeah. from each one. That's a beautiful project that I hope you get to um, continue. Yeah, I think I, I'm, yeah, I'm very inspired from your talk to do that because I looked at the leaves and just said, if these trees and these leaves could talk to me and tell me a story, what yes. would they say? So thank you so much for your talk. Yeah, and, and I also wanted to add, Vonda, uh, one of the things that's helped me is kind of knowing that this nature journaling, you can do it in so many different ways. And one person who I would encourage you to take a look at is a woman. Um, I'm going to put her name up here. She's from the UK and her name is Allie Foxon. And she has a wonderful approach to nature journaling called green sketching. I find that um, if you're not like a naturalist, to me, the sort of the dominant perspectives in nature journaling are naturalist. Uh, scientist and, uh, you know, artist, even scientific illustrator. And um, I would not be discouraged by those. I think that those are, you know, wonderful skills to have. At the same time, for entry-level folks who don't fit into any of those categories, who really want to be encouraged to explore this um, with a more sort of accessible point of view, I think as far as the drawing is concerned, I would recommend looking at Allie Foxen's uh, green sketch and her name, her, uh, her blog is called Boggy Doodles. And she really has this, what I feel is a very accessible um, attitude and approach to nature journaling that encourages people to uh, do it regardless. Okay, I hope, thank you, you're welcome, Vonda. All right, um, last call. My thanks to everybody for participating tonight. And um, I'm at Kim at Cardinal Encounters. Let me put my uh, email address up here. And as I mentioned, I am a outdoor Afro 
uh, leader. So you're welcome to go to our meetup page and uh, look at our Facebook uh, social media and get in touch with if you're not already, if you're not plugged in uh, like Linda and Linda slash Cool Breeze is uh, with our events. And so my yeah. thanks to everybody and Sonia. Yes, thank you to Kim Ruffin. Thank you so much. Um, is there a website for the Outdoor Afro, is that called? Yeah, so it's all our, our, uh, our events are featured through the meetup.com platform. Oh, and meetup. There's a, there's a, yeah, there's a general website, you know, yeah, like meetup. the National Office mm -hmm. maintains a website. So you mm -hmm. will find it at outdoorafro.com, I believe it is. And at the same time, if you want to zoom in real quickly to our specific events in the Chicago slash Northwest Indiana um, network, you can go to the meetup.com platform and look up Outdoor Afro Chicago slash Northwest Indiana. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, if anyone's interested in that. Thank you um, for asking about that. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to end the meeting in a second. And um, that was a very great program for this month, this time of year. All right. Well, thank you so much again, uh, Sonia, for facilitating tonight. And please share my thanks with Ivan. Sure. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Kim. Bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this video, please like the video and subscribe to the Stickney Force View Public Library's YouTube channel. Also, like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The Stickney Forest View Public Library District, where great things happen.